name is Monk Rowe. I'm the director of the Jazz Archive here at Hamilton College. I'm very pleased to be meeting with Don Andre today, class of 58. Right. And uh, torchbearer for the uh, alumni jazz band and uh, traditional jazz uh, in general. That's true. Okay. Uh, yes, I uh, came to the Hill in 1954, and uh, I had had a little experience with playing guitar and ukulele and banjo with just a bunch of kids uh, hacking around, you know. And I got up here, and I was in Carnegie, and I heard a banjo upstairs the first night. And I went up, and um, I was a kid playing a tenor. And uh, I said, could I play it? I said, sure. So I, I started playing it, and um, a fellow in the room said, hey, i got to tell Emerson Brown about you. Who is Emerson Brown? I didn't know. He said, well, you know we have a jazz band here called the Catatonic Five. And I said, oh, that's interesting. So the next day, Emerson showed up at my room and said, I would you like to come down to Paul Parker's house tomorrow for a rehearsal? And I said, fine. So I went down there, and it was Paul Parker, the art professor, uh, rest his soul, playing piano. He was a barrel house Chicago-style player. And his son, Mike, on trumpet, and the other son, Larry, on bass, and a young fellow named uh, Dick Sherman, not the Dick Sherman of today, oh. but a kid from Clinton High School named Skooky, actually, Sherman. And um, so we started to play, and M said, hey, I think we got a banjo player. You know, I said, well, that's great, because I've never really been in a band before. So um, from there on, we started getting gigs, and I went down to Utica to a hawk shop and bought a really awful banjo. Um, which I played. And then the college uh, used us for a concert Friday night of Winter Carnival weekend, right after the basketball came. And in the class of 55 yearbook, in the page that says activities or entertainment or whatever the caption is, there's a two-page two photograph of the band on the stage in Commons. Oh, That's how great. great. So there was six or seven people in the band at that uh, time? At that point, we had, uh, let's see, Pete Ziefeld, I think, was playing piano, me and Emerson, so that makes three. Larry Parker, yeah, there were six. Larry okay. and Mike Parker and Skooky Sherman. Di what did you call the music? Dixieland. Okay. Yeah, that. And I'm, you know, we had a brief conversation about this. Um, I'm still trying to sort out in my head how you guys thought of this music at that time. Because in retrospect, it seems like, well, you were playing music that dates back a long time. Mm -hmm. But you didn't really think of it as dated. No, I, I really didn't think of it as dated. And I lived in the New York area on Long Island. And um, uh, the clubs in New York City, which were experiencing the Dixieland revival period, if you will, with the Condon band, uh, and Max Kaminsky, and there's Nick's in Central Plaza, and Jimmy Ryan's. There was a whole lot of Dixieland being played at the time, at the same time that what people were calling progressive was being played. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we would, as teenagers, go into the New York City to the clubs, you know, and we just had a ball listening to Condon and squandering our, our uh, little, little earned money. Um, and we just loved the music, and uh, we would gather sometimes at friends' houses and, and put on uh, the Firehouse 5 Plus 2, or some of the Condon records, or uh, Goodman's 38 Jazz concert, which we all loved, even though it wasn't Dixieland. Okay. There's a Dixieland portion in that program, but uh, we loved swing, and uh, because it was melodic, and it was rhythmic, um, and it was just something that, that touched us, and it didn't touch everybody. I mean, there were a lot, a lot of uh, my high school friends who didn't, uh, either didn't understand the music or didn't like it or, or whatever. Um, and very few of us were, were players. Uh, and even here at college, we had a couple of groups going. Um, but our group, the Catatonic Five, was the one that seemed to catch on to the fraternity parties. And, uh, but why we all gravitated toward this music as opposed to Progressive is, is, a, is a very difficult question. I, I have to admit that I really enjoyed progressive music at the time as well, 
although I, I said I play the banjo because I can't play that other stuff. <laughs> you mean like uh, Charlie Parker or? Uh, yeah, yeah or, Charlie Parker and uh, well, I remember taking my, uh, my girlfriend who later became my wife, uh, her first uh, experience in a jazz idiom in New York City, we went to a place called The Composer and heard Mary Lou Williams, a uh, black piano player, wonderful, Edmund Thigpen on drums and uh, Whitey Mitchell was on bass. And she just really enjoyed that, mm -hmm. but it was not Dixieland. Right. <laughs> Mary Lou Williams was fairly progressive always. Yes, yes. Was there a distinction uh, with you guys in the listening end of it between Bunk Johnson type black jazz and white players? Was there any distinction? No, there, there really wasn't. Um, uh, in fact, uh, because my introduction to it, if you will, was through the, the uh, the bands that were playing Dixieland or traditional jazz in the uh, late 40s and 50s, I really didn't pay much attention to the earlier stuff. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, uh, some of the records, and some of my friends will shoot me for this, I really didn't like Louis Armstrong. Now I really appreciate him, yeah. you know, very much so. Um, but, but there was just something that was just a little, it didn't quite swing the way the Condon band swung, you know, and mm -hmm. I was more interested in the rhythm. In fact, I used to play the drums in a marching band, uh, so I had always been you know, interested in rhythms and drums and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So that's why I have an instrument that has a head on it. <laughs> Was the Condon band perhaps had some swing influence to it? Well, uh, yeah, I would think so, and I think primarily the swing influence was Eddie Condon himself. Mm -hmm. uh, he played a, a wonderful four-string uh, plectrum guitar that was specially made for him by, uh, by Gibson, but this is after he already had learned banjo and, and uh, gravitated toward a plectrum yeah. guitar. But it was that swinging guitar uh, that, that really propelled the band, I think, except he had sterling drummers and George Wetling and Cliff Lehman, people like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think that was the aspect to it that, that really got to me. We, we felt it was more two beat than four beat. You know. mm. so. Okay. You, f you felt which was more two beat? What we, what, we, what we liked and what we played. Okay. You know, so, and and that, that influence is with me today because I'm not a four beat banjo player. I'm really, uh, I, I play the banjo kind of like the way a drummer plays the drums. You know, you know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then as I get farther into the music and got influenced by some of my colleagues, uh, I began to appreciate the older stuff and the older musicians. And um, of course, I was way behind the power curve in terms of uh, my knowledge, you know, of this kind of thing. And uh, some people I know are collectors and uh, they know an awful lot about the musicians and the music. And our drummer in Washington is, is uh, the supreme collector. Uh, if you ask him a question about a tune, he'll tell you who wrote it and when it was recorded <laughs> and by whom. Sounds like that fellow Phil Schapp, mm -hmm. who, who yeah. <laughs> give it's you more information than you intended. Encyclopedia. Yeah. Well, I'm interested in that 52nd Street scene. Is that where some of these clubs were? Jimmy Ryan's, I believe, was on 52nd uh -huh. Street. And there was also a, a club across the street called the Club Samoa that we would drop into. Samoa. Uh, Samoa. Samoa. Yes. Okay. Had nothing to do with music. Oh, oh. <laughs> I see. What would it had, have cost to get into one of those clubs? Um, I think the cover charge at uh, at Condon's was something like uh, five bucks a piece. Oh, that sounds more expensive than I would have thought. Yeah. Well, um, that w w was a it was a top class club. Yeah. Uh, but there was a cover, and sometimes it was a, like a two-drink minimum or, or something like that, which would take care of the cover, or both. Ryan's was a lot cheaper. I do not remember what that might have cost. Maybe it was a buck you know, to come in. I remember Birdland, uh, where I went to hear Count Basie, had a kind of like a, a cage area with benches, and that cost 25 cents. Oh. But you couldn't get a drink in there, and you weren't at a table. I c so you could be underage and... Be in there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
and that was the attraction of the place. Mm -hmm. you know. yeah. Did you learn anything from watching those bands operate besides just the music? Oh, I think so. I think that, that uh, unconsciously, perhaps, uh, or subconsciously, we were absorbing, I was absorbing how the band was interacting, you know, and how, for example, there would be a soloist and then uh, maybe two other horn guys would back him up with some kind of a riff. Um, and breaks and tags and all that sort of stuff. The organization of the music was just uh, something that I absorbed, and then of course you'd hear it again on a record or something, and uh -huh. it was good. It has a lot more meaning when you, when you see, see it, it live. Yeah, absolutely. So at that point, did you have aspirations to be a professional musician? No, <laughs> not at all. I was, you know, I, I had learned self-taught, uh, learned the ukulele and the guitar, and I played for high school sing-alongs and stuff like that. I had, as I said, when I got here, I had no idea that it was a jazz band or that I would be spending most of my weekends away from Hamilton at other colleges' house parties. That's yeah. pretty neat. It was. It was extremely neat. Um, and, of course, uh, my, my college record probably reflects that. I, I did make it through here. I did, my, did, did get my degree. <coughs> but uh, Lord knows, I don't know how. But um, it, was a, it was a fun four years. What was your major? Uh, English, basically. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is another aspect. Uh, I don't know if Hamilton still has Saturday classes. But uh, back in those days, we did. I avoided them like the plague. And so I tried to uh, organize my schedule so that I never had classes on Saturday. And this meant that I had to take some courses that weren't really ones that I would have appreciated. <laughs> And I didn't stay within the bounds of English. I went to history, music, French. Um, so I had a, you know, if you want to talk about a broad brush, yeah, I had a broad brush education. Um, and uh, it worked because I didn't, I didn't have to go down to Col or Cornell or someplace like that and get back at 2 in the morning and get up and go to class. That wasn't. I think Phil talked about that. Yes. That he wasn't quite so smart as to not have Saturday well, classes. Well, uh, um, if you're a pre-med student or if you're in the sciences, no. um, you know, there's no way around it. As I recall, there was always, you either had a lab on Saturday or a class or something. There must have been some wild uh, frat <laughs> parties you guys played for. Yes, yeah, there, there were some that um, <laughs> I remember in particular uh, <coughs> the Phi Gam House at uh, both Colgate and Cornell. In the spring, they had the, called the Fiji Island party, parties for Phi Gam Fiji. So they all dress up in sarongs and uh, drink some kind of Hawaiian punch. And, uh, it got kind of wild. And then some other house uh, in Colgate had a toga party. They all dress up like Romans and with sheets, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, there were some very wild parties. In fact, uh, this is an anecdote. Uh, I uh, just recently was talking with um, the father of uh, one of my a relative's wife. Anyway, he went to Cornell at the same time I was at Hamilton. And I said, where did, where, were you in fraternity? He said, yes. Delta Phi. And I said, wasn't that the one that was perched on a hill and every spring house party, the guys would slide down the, the side of this steep hill in a mudslide? And he said, yeah, he said, we really got filthy, just filthy. You know, <laughs> we laughed about that. And I said, well, do you remember jazz band playing? He says, oh, yeah. I said, that was me. Oh. So anyway, yes, there were some wonderful parties. So when you came here and you got into the situation you were playing with in a, in a rehearsal, how did, the, how did you learn the songs? Uh, mainly off of records. Um, <clears throat> or... As, as happens, um, somebody might know the melody, and well, Paul Parker would, would chord it for us. And he'd say, you know, this is uh, how it goes. And we'd try and get it, and he said, no, no, that's wrong, you know, so we'd, we'd learn it that way. But for some reason, and I think it's because of this affinity for the music that we all had, and listening to records even before we were in a band, that the, t the tunes were up here. 
they're already in the, in our heads for some reason. Wow. You know, and uh, it's just it was uh, like uh, M would call. Well, let's do um, uh, nobody's sweetheart now. You know, so we just launch into it, and Mike knew the tune, and you know, off off we went. And uh, I was amazed fre frequently about how these tunes just sort of came out. And um, as I said, I, I did a lot of uh, not folks, well, yeah, folks, folk songs, sing-alongs, you know, the old, old tunes from the 20s and the 30s and the mm -hmm. 40s, popular hits like By the Light of the Silvery Moon and yeah. all that stuff. <coughs> of course, we didn't play that, uh, but we did play, <coughs> pardon me, some other tunes that uh, lodged in my brain somehow. But we are a musical family situation. Uh, yes, um, my father uh, played the banjo and the piano in college and wrote, actually wrote the first uh, Ta Kappa Epsilon sweetheart song. All the fraternities had sweetheart songs. And um, so he wrote that and played the piano, played the ukulele too, I guess. And then um, my mother sang alto in church choirs and gave piano lessons. And uh, they met in Florida because my father was soloing. In, in a church on Sundays. And so <coughs> they married, and uh, my brother was born in 28, and I was born in 36, and we were up, moved up north. And my brother was musical, had a great voice, played the trombone, the drums. Uh, and um, so when I came along, and I, I learned to play the ukulele, and then the guitar, we ended up with a family uh, quartet for four-part uh, four harmony. And I, I usually did the courting and sang the melody, and uh, my brother would do the bass, and my dad would do the high tenor, and my mother would do the second tenor, if you will. And uh, I learned harmony, in a way, from that. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was great fun. That's excellent ear training. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we, we did a lot of sitting on the front porch, you know, singing songs. And uh, then when I was in high school, um, I was asked frequently to lead sing-alongs for the boarding student at the school I went to on Sundays, and then we just get together in uh, some common room and I play the ukulele and, uh, you know, so. Do you recall what was being <coughs> played on the radio for the most part when you were, like, as a teenager? Um, some of the pop stuff, not very much jazz. Mm -hmm. I was trying to think of a guy's name on the way over. I used to listen to him on WNEW every night while I did my homework. And uh, he had a show uh, where he played all kinds of jazz, the progressive and big bands and, and some Dixieland. And um, uh, he was, uh, oh, Purple Grotto was the name of the show. Anyway, uh, what was on the, just the regular pop radio were things like Eartha Kitt, you know, and um, Oh, Teresa Brewer, and mm -hmm. I, I can't remember them, but a lot of the popular songs that had nothing to do with jazz, you know, just pop stuff that comes yeah. out all the time. Um, and then, of course, there'd be more classical stuff occasionally, operas on Saturday afternoon, right. which I rarely listen to. But you were never uh, got the notion to switch to the uh, guitar and play Carl Perkins or... Elvis Presley songs. No, no, never. No, huh. I, uh, uh, in fact, it, it, uh, I, I didn't consider a lot of that music, although Elvis did sing in some of these love songs, which, you know, were popular at one time, and he added his own peculiar twist to it. Um, and I thought that was peculiar. I, anyway, <laughs> uh, let's see, what else was I going to say? Oh, yes. Um, in terms of, of what was going on in, in the music world as we progressed through college. I was going over uh, to a concert in 19, I guess it was spring of 58, uh, maybe it was fall. Anyway, uh, at Kai Sai, there was a, they had a stage set up and a band from Syracuse called the Salt City Five <coughs> was, was going to be playing. And I had gone over to Syracuse, I've heard them many times, gone over and sat in with them. <coughs> a wonderful band, and on the way over, <coughs> blasting out of the Deke House windows was Bill Haley's Rock Around the Clock. And so it was a very interesting uh, byplay. Yeah. I would say so. So, 
Yeah. And the little things like that I remember. But um, oh. it was fun, fun times. Really. What was that? Describe uh, one of your busy weekends with the Catatonic oh. Five. <laughs> one I remember in particular, <clears throat> and it's because it was so, <clears throat> pardon me, <coughs> strenuous. Um, we had, uh, it was at Cornell's, Cornell Spring House Party. And we had to go, I think it was uh, the, one of the houses uh, for Friday night. And that was an 8 to 12 gig. And we didn't have anything until the next evening. So we all came back to Hamilton, drove back to Cornell for uh, a cocktail party at Theta Delt. That started at 6, ended at 8. We had to be at Phi Gam at 9. We played from 9 to 1. We got a few hours sleep, and we got up at 8 o'clock to play for the milk punch party at the D5 house with the mudslide. So, and we got home about you know, here at about 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, just absolutely exhausted. But it was a fun weekend. What's the recipe for milk punch? Five-gallon milk can, uh, and you pour out some of the milk, and you replace the, 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 the innards with, with bourbon and uh, ice cream, maybe, and uh -huh. uh, maybe a little uh, cognac. I see. And then you go around with a big dipper, and everybody has a cup like this. Uh -huh. And it, it usually starts around 10 o'clock in the morning, and you know it's starting because you hear guys rapping on the milk can all around the campus as they go through the halls of the dorms. Milk punch, milk punch. I'll be darned. I wonder so if they I still do that. Well, you would know, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, they do have a, a tradition here at uh -huh. Hamilton that I don't know if they call they don't call it milk punch, but it's something. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Concoction or something. Uh, now, Dick Dick Sherman told me that sometimes mm -hmm. you guys got paid with a, a fifth of good whiskey. Uh, Is that true? That was true. Uh, uh, he he graduated in '53. Yeah. You see, so. Uh, I think back uh, in the earlier 50s, um, that's how they were paid. Right. Uh, but no, we wanted cash. <laughs> it was a little you. easier to choose our own booze that <laughs> way. <laughs> For those of us who drank, right. of course. So yeah. who was your drummer mostly during those years? Uh, Skooky Sherman was the, the first one, and then he graduated, and then for the times after that, we were fortunate to be able to use two drummers uh, from Utica. One of them, uh, I think the first kid was Ronnie Zito, who went on, he's uh, now mu stu studio musician and worked with Woody Herman and wonderful, yeah. wonderful drummer. And uh, we couldn't make, he, we couldn't get him for a gig and he says, well, I got this other fellow, his name is Jimmy Wormworth, and uh, you know, he'd be more than happy to do it. So we started alternating, you know, using them both. Um, and then, uh, when it came time to go to Europe, Ronnie's father was afraid that he was going to, he was sick, and he was afraid he was going to pass away while we were in Europe, and Ronnie wouldn't be able to get home for whatever. So, Ronnie couldn't go to Europe, so we took Jimmy. And um, Jimmy also played with us in Carnegie Hall, and then both went on to uh, professional careers. Jimmy is still, well, both of them are still playing. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy ended up with um, Lambert Hendricks and Ross in the Ike Isaacs trio, <coughs> right. and now he works around uh, New York, and most recently did a European tour with Annie Ross. He did. Yeah. That's great. Yes. Yeah. Right. He, he talked about that, uh -huh. that little stint with you guys on the ship and everything. And we, we had a very interesting trip through Europe. It How was so? superb. Uh, <coughs> well, uh, First of all, we were over there for two months. We got off the ship, and uh, we had um, an engagement already arranged in Holland. But that got delayed because we needed work permits, and we didn't have them. And so uh, that was the better part of July that we were involved there. And then around the 1st of August, we rented two Opals and uh, toured around. Went all the way down into Italy and back up through Germany and back to Holland. And uh, then got back on the boat and came back in September. Were you playing on those tours? Uh, we could? had a few engagements. Yeah. Uh, the Army hired us in Koblenz. We played on street corners in Paris and got arrested. <laughs> <laughs> we played <coughs> on the Grand Canal in Venice, and the police came along and said, uh, please, would you move to the next obelisk because you're disturbing the symphony orchestra in the main square. So, 
Oh, we, we were just so had a hat on the floor, you know, yeah. Yeah, on yeah. the ground. And then <clears throat> when we got back to Holland, we were asked to go to a hotel up in the very, very north of Holland. And we played for teenagers in the afternoon and then played for adults in the evening. And uh, the owner of the hotel put us up overnight and paid our train fare back and forth. I see. A little, little pay. So, um, but the, the stint in Europe was, was uh, in Holland, that is, uh, was two weeks. Uh, and that was the, really the, the only formal engagement we had lined up before we went. Mm -hmm. And the thing at Carnegie Hall was when you came back? When we came back, it was the following November. I see. <clears throat> yeah, we, we got that job through the uh, auspices of uh, a fellow named Dave Cook, clarinet player with the Dartmouth Indian Chiefs, uh, which was a, a band that was one of our, uh, not I wouldn't say rivals, because we operated in a, in a different market. Uh, but um, he suggested to uh, Jim Carpenter, that who, who was running the college jazz, uh, goes to Carnegie Hall, that <clears throat> we were a pretty good band and they ought to give us a try. So uh, we did, and they did, and we, we ended up playing uh, opposite an all-star band from the Central Plaza in New York. And uh, that's, we played two sets each and then had one set together, and that was quite an experience. <laughs> I'll bet. <coughs> standing in, <coughs> pardon me, standing on the stage at uh, Carnegie at Hall. At Carnegie Hall. Looking around saying, wow, you know, great things that have happened here. People yeah. have been on this stage. Did the college take note of that? Uh, yes, they did, but not really as much as I would have liked. It was uh -huh. over Thanksgiving holiday, and uh, people could have gone, but we didn't have a good showing from, from Hamilton uh, mm -hmm. people. Did from my high school. Um, I would say that, you know, Carnegie Hall was not full by any means. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but, <coughs> excuse me. Sure. I'm curious as to your relationship, the band in general, with the college. Was there a relationship? Did you have anything to do with the music department? Um, no, not really. We were pretty much on our own. I, I will say that a lot of the faculty were sympathetic to our schedule, if you will. I remember in a couple of instances having an assignment due on Monday and I had to go to the professor and I say, I'm, I, you know, the band is, uh, and he'd say, well, okay, turn it in Tuesday. And that was great, you know, um, to get that kind of uh, leniency. And Dean Tolles um, was uh, very sympathetic. Uh, and some of the other professors thought, well, you know, th this is a good thing for the school, you know, uh, even though these kids are on the brink of ruin, <laughs> except Emerson was a very bright guy. And I, I think that... Uh, yeah. But if he, he said, Donnie's going to go play someplace, and then they kind of let us, you know. Uh -huh. <coughs> but uh, I, I think that that may have had something to do with um, how I got through this place, was having a sympathetic ear among the faculty, and including the dean. In fact, I remember right after I joined the band and we started playing around, and I believe it was winter party, February 1955, and Dean Tolles came over along with most of the faculty for uh, a cocktail party at the Alpha Delta House, which was kind of a tradition. And I uh, remember the description that, uh, I don't know if you heard Phil's, Phil Mead's speech today, but he was talking about the suit he always wore, and a rumpled tie and a rumpled uh, shirt and, and everything. And I remember he was standing there with uh, some kind of liquid in his left hand, and and a cigarette in his right hand, and the ashes <laughs> dribbling down his tie. And he says, Don, you know, your grades aren't what they should be. I really think you ought to stop this music business. And I said, well, Dean, you know, um, I'm on a scholarship. I understand that I have to keep my grades up, but also I'm working at the house as a waiter. Uh, and so um, I need that little bit of money. And he said, well, if you have a problem, come and see me. Well, I never had to. But I think he kept an eye out, which mm. he did for everybody, as everybody knows. So, That's excellent. Um, <coughs> he and was a friend. You were in a f fraternity. Yes, Alpha Delta. And how were the fraternities different back then? Well, we were a lot freer um, in our activities, although the college really didn't like 
uh, some of the partying that went on. Although at house party time, a lot was forgiven. You know, I mean, the, the ladies, the dates were housed in the fraternity houses, and all the guys had to move out and bunk in the dorm someplace. Oh. And uh, so that was an interesting aspect to it. Another interesting aspect was uh, the fact that every house, having a house party with dates in it, had to have a chaperone couple. <coughs> and the chaperones all met with uh, Sid and Ellie Wertimer uh, sometime on Friday before the party started, and the uh, rules were laid down. And um, it, was, it, was, it was pretty much controlled, uh, I, I would say, that uh, we had beer available in the house. We had a refrigerator downstairs, so there wasn't a taboo on that at all. Uh, some of the fraternities were a little wilder than others, depending upon the makeup of, of the people in it. And um, in our particular house, we had all kinds of people. We had the uh, athletes, we had the scholars, road scholars in one case, yeah. <coughs> musicians, concert guys, you know, the choir. I think we had 65 members at one time, and some of them lived in the dorms, but we had to have every bed in the house occupied to keep oh. the, the bills uh, <coughs> current. Anyway, uh, I don't really know about the fraternity aspect now. I just know that uh, I wish that the fraternity system had not been changed to the uh, extent that it has been. I do get regular reports from my uh, Alpha Delta Phi fraternity here, members and what they're doing and uh, really concentrating on literary uh, means. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're thinking about, if the college will let them do it, is um, with the national fraternity's assistance buying a place where they could have meetings off campus. And of course, what everyone's afraid of there uh, in the administration would be that these would be party holes. Right. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't really think that's ever going to happen. But yeah. right now, um, the Samuel Eels Memorial Hall was the, was the Alpha Delta House. And it's been, when it was bought by the college for uh, an unbelievably low amount of money, yeah. um, they expa expanded it. And it's, it's really a beautiful place. But uh, every time I go in there, a lot of the downstairs is still exactly the same. Oh. The wallpaper on the, you oh. know, and all that stuff. It really really a very nice, uh, very nice place to live. And I lived there for uh, two and a half years. Was the drinking age 21? No, 18. It was, it I don't was know 18? when it, it was 18. And then it went up and that, it came that's back why, down then. Uh, I don't know where it was. No, no, wait, no, no, no. It's no. still 21. I'm wrong. Yeah. It's 21 now. It was, yeah, and it, it <coughs> changed in the early 80s or something. Right, and okay. uh, New York was one of the last to change, as I recall. I see. Um, no, we, uh, there was no problem with that, with that. In fact, I would venture to say that <coughs> some of the drinking that goes on <coughs> in colleges today is perhaps because of the age limit. You know, they sneak it around and they get perhaps a, a little more than they should. Mm -hmm. um, and there's trouble. Yeah. But uh, so. most, of the, most of the guys here, because it's an isolated school, if we had a house party, and people were drinking, it was here, it stayed here. It's kind of like, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, mm -hmm. same thing here in Hamilton. And, you know, we never, if you went down the hill, you might not come back up. <laughs> anyway. it was, was it, did, did at the time, did you feel like it was isolated here? Um, yeah, sometimes I yeah. did. Uh, and uh, in, in good weather, anyway, uh, Friday afternoon, somebody would say, roll them or wheels up, you know, and off we would go to Skidmore or Wells. Oh. 90 miles, didn't matter. Yeah. You know, Neat. and uh, sometimes we even went to Casanova. Yeah, that was. That's a girls' school, right? It it, yes, it was. Yeah. I don't know. It may still be. I, I, I don't know. It was a junior college then. Mm -hmm. But. Um, Do you remember what your tuition was in those years? Um, Let's see, Phil, the, s the figure $700 for tuition uh, strikes a bell. And uh -huh. <coughs> that, that coupled with uh, the um, room and board, which was a whole different billing, 
uh, ended up to be around $1,100, $1,200. And I was on a half tuition scholarship, and a little more money came in from working. I had a job in the fraternity mm -hmm. the whole time I was here, doing one thing or another. Um, so it was about 1100 and as Phil said today in his speech, next year's tuition and board and room is 49000 That's That's a hunk of change. Yeah. Wow. But even then, you know, um, $1,100 was, uh, was not exorbitant, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it was still cheaper to go to a public college right. or a university. Is there something you got from Hamilton that you can put into words that really made a difference for you in your career? Um, I, I think a, uh, the thing that uh, strikes me most is a feeling of um, one, independence, and two, being able to accomplish something and saying, yeah, you know, it's, it was the uh, perseverance aspect. And part of that was the college itself and, and part of it due to professors really pushing you to do well and appreciating it uh, and telling you so if you did well. And the other aspect, of course, was uh, being involved with a jazz band and, and booking the gigs and making the arrangements and all of that, uh, which was kind of like running a business. <laughs> so, um, and I was not a businessman. I went into the federal government. You don't have to be a businessman to be in the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have personality clashes in the, in the band? No. Wow. That's saying something. I know. And the same thing is held true in, well, the band that I've been most recently associated with in Washington, the Federal Jazz Commission, there has never been to my knowledge, any kind of a, an open dispute, really, about anything. And of course, I'm just a side man, and I have known the leader for, for many, many years and worked in the band, 18 years. <coughs> but he had that band for, I guess, 30. Uh, so I don't know all of the history of all of that. But generally speaking, in Hamilton, no, there wasn't any problem. Yeah. Unless uh, somebody couldn't make a gig, which happened occasionally. And then um, there was no animosity about it. You know, I can't make it. I either got another gig, or I've got class, or um, or something. Yeah. So some of the guys played with other groups too on well, occasion. Well, only only the drummer. Oh. Only the drummers. Oh yeah. Jimmy and Ronnie. Uh, they they played all over the place. But then again, when I had to hire somebody, to get them to play with the band, um, they might have been from. You know, like Syracuse from another band, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we had, um, and I, you may be familiar with these names, but we had a, a gig at Elmira, and needed a piano and a bass player, and Jimmy Wormworth is playing drums, and so he said, "How about how about these guys?" And I said, "Well, who are they?" And he said, "Well, it's Ron Carter on bass, and Gap Mangione on piano, Chuck Mangione's brother." <clears throat> no kidding. So. We played at Elmira College, it was a rainy day, and when the Dixieland stopped, there was a nice little trio of Carter, Mangione, and Jimmy Wormworth. Oh, that. And of course, I love that because, I, as I say, I did like that kind of music. It was a little, um, well, Gap Mangione was a fine piano player, but very esoteric, I would say. Hmm. Ron Carter must have been at Eastman at that time, I think. I, I, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, spent some time in Rochester. Yeah, and I, I, I bought a couple of his uh, CDs, and frankly, uh, I liked the way he played back then better than mm -hmm. <laughs> Of course, he's, he's recognized as one of the premier bass, bass sure is, in yeah. the world. But, <coughs> pardon me, um, and there were a couple of other in instances where uh, we, we, were, we had to bring in somebody else, and of course, this meant a lot of phone calls, uh, and uh, making sure they could get picked up or whatever, you know. And that was, that was the trying part of it. It wasn't a very simple thing. Transportation was a bug because I didn't have a car. <coughs> and I had to borrow cars all the time. And I once, I think I was talking to Phil, and I said, you know, why don't we go buy a used hearse? 
It's big. You can fit the whole band in there, uh, you know, you paint it or put something in the windows. And so <clears throat> when I went home on vacation, I asked my mother if she would loan me some money to buy a vehicle. And she, what? And I said, I'd like to buy a used hearse. She said, absolutely not. I will not have a hearse parked anywhere near my house. <laughs> so... I can't say as I blame her. <laughs> no. <clears throat> anyway, so we Even if did. you dress it up, oh. it's still a hearse. Yeah. <laughs> oh. It we would were, have fit. I'm sorry. It would we have fit we mentioned a, uh, <clears throat> a person we both know, Dave Robinson. Mm -hmm. And you th I'm sure you know him through the Dixieland circles mm -hmm. down there. Um, I saw him at, a, I think it was two years ago, at a jazz educators conference. And he was speaking on a panel, and the, the title of the panel was Trad Jazz is Alive and Well. Mm -hmm. And I said, did you come up with that title? And he said, no, someone <laughs> else did. You know, So he had to address this thing, and, and actually I don't know that he actually agreed with the title. But mm -hmm. So my long intro is, do you think, is there a reason that Dixieland jazz doesn't seem to have the attention paid to it that almost any other style of jazz does. Um, I don't know why. I understand what you're saying, and yes, it's absolutely true. I mean, some of the music that becomes popular and stays popular attracts a larger audience and more money as well. You know, I mean, stadiums full of people for Springsteen and things like that. You know, and. As I said, Carnegie Hall wasn't full when we played there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I, I have no idea. Uh, a lot of people say it, it sounds so much the same. Whatever tune you play, whether it's fast or slow, and even if it's a different melody, it still sounds the same. Well, it's got a structure to it, you know? And um, y if you stay pretty much within that structure, then it, it's going to sound a little bit alike. The, the, the interplay between the horns uh, and the rhythm section is doing its thing behind them. Uh, and sometimes the, the tune itself will be without any solos. It'll be all ensemble uh, with the horns doing, you know, in three-part harmony or sometimes unison. But um, I, I just don't know. I think that one, that's what somebody said to me. Now, Dave Robinson has had this uh, youth group, you know, used to be called the Federal Focus. And I got them to change it because there was a conflict with our band yeah. in the name. <clears throat> so they changed it to, um, oh, Potomac Focus. I don't know what it's called now. But anyway, he's had a couple of uh, very good musicians come out of that band. And one of them, I remember a drummer, uh, I think his name is Brett Hunter. Anyway, he, he uh, worked with the Federal Jazz Commission uh, once or twice. And I asked him, I said, aren't you working? He said, no, you know, there's no call for this music. But another player, a clarinet player, uh, Hallie Schoenberg, is playing. Uh, but she's not playing Dixieland. She's mm -hmm. playing with trios and, and quartets, doing essentially, uh, I guess, what you call jazz, what they call jazz. Yeah. Nowhere near traditional. OK. So it's a mystery. Yeah. I feel like Dixieland is, is very happy music most of the time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel like that works against it because if it's so happy it's not really serious uh, yes know, I understand. and maybe it's not worth yeah. worthy of study or you know I don't know either well I, I, I would agree with you and that's probably why a lot of the what we would consider icons of the music you know people like Condon or Wild Will Davison or or King Oliver or Louis Armstrong haven't been recognized, except Louis was world famous, but I mean, mm -hmm. have not been recognized outside of a, a small group of the public for the type of musician and the quality musician uh, that they were. And I think that's really too bad. Um, I mentioned Wild Bill Davison to somebody who was uh, a Springsteen fan, for example. They say, who, what, when? You know, no, absolutely no knowledge. Yeah. But I will tell you that probably some classical musicians who play in, in philharmonic uh, orchestras and stuff like that, they, they probably know these names. Um, because they, it's, it's, it's a, 
they're good musicians themselves and they recognize that they're the talent. Mm -hmm. In the years you were here, uh, obviously some members graduated and stuff. Was, was there competition to get into the yeah. Catatonic Five? Uh, yes, there was. Uh, there were uh, a horn player who, and a piano player, and they went off and formed their own band. And then when we needed a piano player, sometimes we used this one fellow, but the, the other guy on trumpet was not really uh, tuned in that much. In fact, uh, for a couple years, and when we went to Europe and when we went to Carnegie Hall, um, our piano player and uh, trumpet player were from Colgate. Oh. And I don't know how that happened. I mean, we were desperate for a musician, a piano player, and, and a trumpet player in September of whatever year it was that they joined the band. And I guess Emerson knew somebody at Colgate and said, do you know any guys that play? And they said, yeah, there's these two guys. And they're both pretty good. The piano player was extraordinarily good. He was exceptional. Uh, so he went to Europe with us, but he couldn't make the Carnegie Hall gig. So we used another fellow who was part of the original Catatonic Five, Derry Hall, who was from Clinton. Um, so I have to say that while a lot of the, the people here at Hamilton, the students, really liked the band, in fact, we played for the college on more than two or three occasions, uh, big concert, you know, important concert things for the, for the jazz concert weekend, for example. Um, <clears throat> but the students were so busy with their studies. I mean, even my roommates said, how do you do this? How, how can you go to school? How can you pass this course if you're out playing jazz all the time? I mean, they, they, they liked it and appreciated that somebody was doing it, but um, they weren't interested in, in trying. Mm -hmm. you know? They what left their horns at home when they went yeah. to college. What did your mother say about it? All I remember her saying, and, and this was kind of strange, she said, why are you taking English? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, she, she was, uh, both my parents were, were very happy that I was playing music. Uh, they had no idea, really, of how much traveling I was doing back and forth. Yeah. Uh, and we never got in any trouble, and we only had a couple of car accidents, you know, so. Only uh, a couple. Only a couple. That's I heard that. this story last night about coming back from, I think it was Cornell and uh, some uh, St. Bernard or Great Dane puppy ended up in the car. Was this, this maybe must, before this, you or I, I after you? I think it was you? before me. I don't remember any okay. Great Dane puppy. All right. It was called Moose or something. Oh, no, that was Emerson's dog. Oh. It wasn't a Great Dane. It was a, it was a sandy colored uh, mutt. Oh, okay. And, and yeah, he, and em, Emerson would take the dog with him on gigs. And I don't know, there, there were some problems sometimes, and Moose would jump out of the car, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we we did, have, uh, did have fun. Yeah. Um, and when you got out, did you find other playing opportunities pretty steadily? Uh, as a matter of fact, no. Um, after I got out in, in 58, I found myself in a position of possibly being drafted. And so I joined the Army so I could go to the language school. And I did that, and I picked a language that I thought would land me in Germany, where I wanted to go, and it sent me to Fort Meade instead. Mm. And so I ended up uh, going to Fort Meade and then uh, becoming a civilian at the same agency. And that's where I worked for 38 I years. I see. Did you just, you did a two-year stint? No, three. three. Yeah, when you enlisted, you had to go for three, oh. but then you got three years of inactive reserve, which means I, I didn't have to go to meetings. But in answer to your question of whether or not I continued playing, well, I had my banjo sent out to Monterey, and um, uh, the language I was taking, which was Czech, we had a little song session on Friday afternoon. And I would play the banjo, and uh, we had a bass player and another guitar player, so we, we, we uh, played along for the Czech folk songs. And, but there was no opportunity for, for a band or uh, anything like that. And when I got to the Washington area, things were kind of in the doldrums. This was uh, in 1960. And I honestly cannot remember when my first paying gig occurred back in Maryland. I, and I don't even remember who it was with. Uh, but uh, things sort of came along and uh, 
musicians get to be known, and then you have these big jam sessions, and people will hire you or they'll form a band. And we had a lot of, a lot of small bands around in the 70s. <clears throat> and then I joined a band called Southern Comfort, and then from there, I went on an assignment overseas, and when I came back, I joined uh, the Federal Jazz Commission. Um, but uh, right after college, no, there was, uh, there was nothing going on. In fact, because the music picture had changed in the public arena, in other words, had gone to Bill Haley and that kind of music, uh, ev even the Dixieland revival dried up in New York. Um, and that was the end of that style of music. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't about to join the Presley crowd. I see. <laughs> Not even tempted. Not even tempted, <laughs> no. When, when you get in a situation, um, I mean, I always felt like the, the rhythm players, the bass and the guitar, the banjo, how do I put this? You have to know a song better than the horn players. That's how I felt in that situation because horn players can find single notes, they can sort of meander their way through things, and, mm -hmm. but you guys have to play the correct changes and stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that's very true, the, uh, the, uh, the rhythm section. And even the drummer, I, was, I, I judge the a, a quality of a drummer by the, the way that he plays the tune, the accents that he puts in at the right place and mm -hmm. at the right time. And some drummers are good drummers, but they just don't have a feel for the music or they don't know the tune frankly. But as far as people who are making, doing notes like me with chords or Gordy on the tuba or a bass player, you really have to know the tune pretty well. Because if you don't play the right changes, you can throw the lead horn off something yeah. terribly. And uh, I have a friend that, cores, that, that says what I do on salads sometimes sounds like chord salad. What did I say? Chords. Chords, when I'm doing chords, uh, I screw them up so badly that it sounds like chord salad. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you have a good bass player or, or tuba man and you can rely on them hitting that downbeat note, yeah. but if they're not, then <laughs> like, it can be hairy. Huh? That's absolutely right. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> Sometimes, you know, you're both feeding off of each other, and if you both don't know the tune very well, it's, it's not fun. <laughs> right. Is there, um, you know, in the in more swing oriented, uh, we have the real book, the sort of the Bible. Of, mm -hmm. Is there a, a quote, real book of Dixieland tunes, twenty songs that everybody should know? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, uh, there is. Uh, uh, there are fake books that have been call them fake books. Yeah. Um, that have uh, many different tunes in them. And sometimes you, in a music story, you'll say, you know, 21 most favorite Dixieland tunes. And <clears throat> I look through it and I say, well, they're not my favorites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but right. yeah, sure, there, there, are, there are these around. Yeah. And uh, there are some core tunes that everybody knows, mostly, and we sometimes refer to them as vanilla because, you know, uh, they're just standards, uh -huh. chestnuts, if mm -hmm. you will. Yeah. And uh, they're the ones that uh, were probably what we played in the Catatonic Five when we first started out and then developed our own book of tunes that we played and arrangements and things. Did the group uh, in Washington ever, I'll, I'll rephrase, is there such a thing as new Dixieland tunes? Are um, people writing that you're aware of? There have been some tunes written uh, more recently than, yeah, I would say uh, you know, tunes that might have been written in the 70s or the 80s mm -hmm. or, or even the 90s. Um, uh, somebody wrote a tune for Southern Comfort as uh, Southern Comfort at Shakey's or a night at Shakey's or something like yeah. that. And it was kind of uh, like a standard Dixieland mm -hmm. tune, you know, like, like a chestnut, if you will. And that's why they're unremarkable, because they sound so much like something else. Right. Uh, but no, th there's nobody really trying to do that, because um, there's no market. Yeah. What do you think of what Jim Cullum does? Oh, I like that band. Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, in fact, uh, 
Uh, I have uh, something for you. Uh, it's a CD by a fellow who used to be our clarinet player, <coughs> Ron Hockett, who plays for Jim Cullum now um, and played with us for many years. And I also played with Ron on other gigs with other bands uh, throughout his time. He spent, I think he spent his whole career in Washington, mm -hmm. in the Marines, in the, Mari <coughs> the Marine Band. <coughs> so. Um, Arver's record has uh, published something called Finally Run, and it's his own uh, quartet or, or quintet, I guess. It's very nice stuff. Oh, neat. So I have one of those for you. <coughs> um, but Cullum is a very uh, colorful guy. He's also uh, kind of a strict disciplinarian, I understand. Um, but I have played with him a couple of times when he showed up you know, in Washington and came and sat in for a couple of numbers. <clears throat> but that's, that's really mm -hmm. uh, the, the extent, I think. Oh, uh, are you familiar from you with the Bela Fleck? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know how to explain that guy. He is an incredible musician. Uh-huh. And picking the banjo as his lead instrument, you know, is... <clears throat> really? Really, but he plays some out outrageous stuff. He sure does. He's got outrageous musicians with him, too. Oh, yeah. 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 He's been here a couple times. Really? He's quite popular. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. I've never seen him in person, though. Just <coughs> CDs. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm drying up here. Well, is there any uh, thing that you make sure you wanted to clear up about the history of the <coughs> alumni jazz band? Well, I, I think that... Um, Probably the highlight uh, of, of our career uh, were, the, were the two things that we did in 1956, and that was the trip to Europe <coughs> and all things associated with that, and then the uh, Carnegie Hall concert. And how those two things happened, I explained about uh, you know the Carnegie Hall thing. Uh, the, um, the boat trip to Europe, back in those years, 55, uh, it may have been the first year, the Holland American Line was running student sailings. At 800 students crammed on an old Liberty ship. And uh, <coughs> the Tiger Town Five from Princeton had played the year before. <coughs> and I read about that someplace. And I was chatting about this in the fraternity house one day and mentioned Holland America Line. And one of my fraternity brothers, a classmate, Freddie Ridgman, said, Well, my grandfather founded the line. Do you think you guys might want to play on it? Oh. Holy cow. <laughs> so I said, sure. Would you ask whoever you need to ask whether or not uh, we could have an audition uh, and, and take a chance on it? He said, sure. He came back and he said, here's the name of the guy to call. So I called him up and wrote him a letter. And I said, this is who we are. And we'd like to try out and be part of one of these student sailings. And we went down to Hoboken and, and auditioned. I heard two tunes. He says, you're hired. So, you know, we got on the boat and toward the end of June and uh, played every day, every evening, and whenever they wanted us to play. <coughs> and we had cabins, and we, you know, it was a free, free passage back and forth on these two Dutch uh, uh, liners. And so that was, um, that was a very exciting, and it was a lot of fun, of course, with all the kids. And, uh, there's some stories of that which I won't go into right now, but... Um, Leading up to that, I was reading in Time magazine, there was a Dutch piano player, a lady named Pia Beck, who was in New York uh, while I was on um, Christmas vacation. And so um, I read about her, something about the Dutch dynamite or whatever. And I called the William Morris Agency, and I said, I'd like to get in touch with this lady. So they gave me her telephone number. And I called her and I said, I'm in a college jazz band and we're going to Holland America Line. We're going to be in Rotterdam and such and such. Oh, you must come and play in my club. So uh, we did that. And uh, we had contracts with, the, con uh, with, with the, uh, the club before we went over. And then I said earlier that we had trouble with working permits. Mm -hmm. Now we finally played and we played in three different clubs every night, three sets in each club. And so, you know, we got back to the apartment in The Hague at, mid at, at dawn, you know. But it was fun. You did th three clubs in a row? Yeah, they were all oh. in the same building. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, 
<coughs> so we uh, we played, and one was uh, one was uh, uh, called the Flying Dutchman, another one was called Scheherazade, and the third one was the Galleries. The Galleries was a great big club, posh, you know, with curtains and stuff. And we were a show band, and so uh, that was that. And uh, the Sherm wasn't on that. Uh, Dick Sherman wasn't with us on that, but Phil was, and he remembers those things. But they know very little about the the workup. To it. And I said, well, we're going to Europe, and this is when we leave, <laughs> you know, and all of that. But they had no idea about the contracts or, or mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, so that's, that's an aspect that, uh, as I said, it was like running a business. Yeah, that's quite an accomplishment. It was fun. It was sort of a leap of faith to get on the boat and, mm. well, let's see what happens. Absolutely. I heard something about your banjo broke. Yes. When you got on the ship somehow. We, we played on the dock as the, as the kids were coming on board. Uh -huh. And then we put our instruments away, and we were supposed to play at 8 o'clock that night in the lounge. And so I um, get up to the lounge, and I open the case, and I lifted the neck of the banjo, and it came right off the rest of it. And there I was with strings and banjo in two parts. <coughs> Fortunately, the social chairman, a Dutch guy who was in charge of us, saw my predicament. We went downstairs immediately, down in the front of the, the bow of the ship to the carpenter shop. And they jabbered in, in Dutch. And they said, the guy said, yeah, OK. So I came back two days later, and had been glued together and had it in a vise. And um, this is my old um, Paramount antique, which is still in one piece today. Oh. Wow. And it, 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 it suffered through the whole trip to Europe and mm -hmm. uh, all that. That's cool. But talk about, you know, here we're underway. We've already gone out to sea, and I don't have an instrument. So I had a couple nights off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Become a social yes, chairman. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been a fascinating talking to you. It's been I know, a pleasure. Uh, we both got class dinners to get to. And yes. Well, I hope you have a good gig tonight. I, I think we you will. You guys but always seem to rise to the occasion. It, I, think we'll, we'll, I think we'll have fun, and uh, it'll be another, another good time. Yeah. And I want to thank you for your time. OK. And uh, maybe we'll see you later. You will. Great. Okay. okay. Thank you very much.